This is my 1996 Nissan 300ZX. I've owned this car for about a year now, and I thought it'd be pretty cool to make a transformation video from the day I bought it to where it sits today. While building this 300ZX, I was also repairing my 240SX and my Nissan Gloria, as well as doing maintenance on the Integras that I own. Let's start where it all began, the day I bought it. My gosh, we have enemies. Look at that ride fitment, dude. Flush? Yeah, it's a subway commercial foot long fitment. <laughs> so not satisfying. Look at that. <laughs> that was a fun start. Let's see how the drive shaft looks. Oh, this is carbon. I didn't even know that. Thanks for helping me out, dude. You're welcome. Hey. So what do you think, Z expert? <laughs> Nate's first car was a Z. He's been trying to chase to get another one ever since. Someone probably tried to remove this. Yeah, right. All one, piece. one, two, three. We got some speed, dude. Lawn ornament number. Yes. Well, I've left the Z here for a couple days and it came back, and Nate, my brother, has assembled the front end and he found some parts for it. What do you think, Seth? But we still have the window issue because there's no windows and no quarter window. But he did find some glass for me. Now we're gonna have to raise and lower the window to tighten all the bolts correctly. Can't forget the window trim. This goes right here. This big old box can't just be for the speakers. Ugh. This nasty tan. That's what we have for now, so we're gonna run it. Then hopefully burn it later. <laughs> These handles look identical to the S13. I wonder if they're the same. We got one here. Look at that, it's identical. Now let's just hope that we got our window settings correct and they fit on the seal. Perfecto. First try. It's already looking better. It's got a window. Now let's do the other side. Hopefully this will be a lot faster. I'm not too sure what I want to put in this thing. I'm not so eager to put the VG30 back in there, which is the original motor. But I think it would be really interesting to put a KA Turbo in here. I've never seen a 300ZX with a KA24 DET. It is a truck motor, so it would be able to move this big old boat. Chances are we have your part. Shoot, I hope so. I guess we're gonna find out. I've never been to this yard before. Looking forward to seeing what they got. What is this? 240. It's a poor car. <laughs> Crackless dash? What? So it has a complete KA. How many miles are on this thing? Only 75,000? What? What? Why is it in this condition? This is probably a good KA. I'm assuming this is why it's in here. Probably just got in a fender bender or something. And I think it's okay to assume with this car that this is the original cluster because everything else is bone stock. This looks like just some old guy's car. I don't know if it's gonna fit on the aisle. I guess maybe. I guess they have it spaced out accordingly. And now we just start yanking it out. A good rule of thumb before buying any engine, especially a junkyard engine, 
is to make sure it has good compression. Now we're not able to crank this motor over and do it properly. First thing I like to do is just see if it spins for one. And in this case, it spins very nicely, but not freely. You don't want it to spin too easy because then that means you have no compression. Then I look for four even compression strokes since this is a four cylinder, but you have to make sure the spark plugs are still in it, which I do feel. And you can hear the intake kind of hissing. I guess it's got some vacuum going on in there, which is a good sign. And then the next thing I like to do is pop off the valve cover. That way you can see the valve train and see how gunked up the oil is or if it's rusty in there. This filter has a date on it, 321, 2018. So it's been sitting for at least four years or the oil hasn't been changed for four years. I'd say this looks pretty dang good. It's definitely not super clean, but it's also not gunked up at all. Just good enough for me. Here she goes. Now that's one loaded cart right there. Oh, I wish you could just pull in back here and make it a lot easier. I might actually have to take off the hatch. No, that's a truck. And give it a rotate and then let her down. Just hope that this fits and clears the trunk. It's pretty dang close, so it might actually clear. There you have it. It actually closed. Oh, it's already rubbing. This is going to be a really fun hour and a half drive home. <laughs> Yeah, what you think? Rear engine swap. <laughs> it's crazy that it did it. Dude, right? It closed with no problem, too. Oh, no trans? No, it was auto. Oh, true. I might not even need to take the hatch off. This is gonna fit in between your two super nice cars. Another junkyard day. I haven't been to this yard in a while. Let's see what we can find today. Right off the bat, we get a Z. What the heck? Black interior. Super nice carpet. Manual? With the trans? Dude, what? What kind of a find is this? We got a smile. <laughs> My gosh. Still got the motor. Just a complete manual 300ZX. Sitting in the junkyard. Still has the rear carpet though. And the floor mats. The gift that keeps on giving. Holy rust and poop. We're gonna start working in the engine bay and try and get this master off. That's the last thing you need to do to free the pedal. We got everything detached from the inside and that was not easy at all. All right, got it. There was this weird little spacer gasket thing on this side of the firewall. This is what it looks like. I've never seen anything like this. I'll be sure to keep this in case we need it. Attached everywhere where the carpet was on the car and I still can't get this seat out. So we're gonna have to figure out something else. I got it. Luckily one of the workers let me borrow their sawzall really quick. But I still need to get this rail out. This is by far the hardest carpet I have ever had to pull. Although we're finally getting somewhere. Ugh. We did it. So I asked if I can grab the calipers off of this car. And that's how they do it. They just take the wheels off and plop it on the ground. made it to Nate's because we're going to drop off all the interior bits. So if anyone needs tan interior, let me know. It's either going to be free or a trade for a cliff bar. Oh, I didn't know this was tan. I'm going to have to grab this stuff. For some reason, I thought this was black up here. Oh, here's the trans over here. I honestly wonder what their reaction is going to be when they see me pull up 
in a two-door Integra to pick up a motor and trans. Drop it. The hatch is definitely not going to close, but that's all right. It fits. Thanks a lot, dude. Yeah, no problem. First, we need to figure out mating this to the Z transmission and cleaning this up and updating it and resealing it. And we also need to delete all the emission stuff going on back here. So this is what we have to work with right now. It shouldn't be too hard to fit a KA24 in here, considering it had the massive VG. There are some things I want to verify before dropping the motor in, because I know for a fact I'm probably gonna have to make custom motor mounts. So what I was thinking is to try and mount an S14 subframe in here. That way the motor mount locations would be in the correct spots. Unfortunately, it's a little muddy, so it might not be a good idea to use a jack in the grass. That should be good. Oh, where are we gonna put this? Oh, I'll just put it right here. <laughs> Seat belts do the trick. Before we go putting the knuckles and coilovers and lower control arms on and tension rod brackets, I'm gonna start with measuring the subframes. That way we can make sure that everything is in the same dimension. Because it's common for S13s and R32s to share subframes and parts like that. But I haven't seen much information on Z32s. Before I drop this subframe all the way out, because that's a lot of work to do, I'm just going to use this little mount for the subframe. This is the exact width of the S13, S14 subframe here. We're going to see if those line up. And they don't. Here's the studs for the Z32 here in here and you can tell the z32 is about an inch longer so unfortunately i don't think this is going to work out well since we're not going to use this subframe the next thing i want to do is start the manual swap process this looks like a little plate in here this is where the clutch and master cylinder are supposed to go inside and outside but it looks like they have it sealed up pretty good is this just glued on then oh i think this is actually spot welded so i very carefully removed this plate I was worried I wasn't going to be able to find the hole that mounts the upper piece of this clutch pedal. But I realized that that bolt is actually on here already. There it is. It was just mounting these relays. Finally got that upper bolt on there. That was not easy to get. Oh, look who's here. Pizza delivery? <laughs> what you got? <laughs> I don't know what I got, dude. It looks like I got a clutch and some other stuff, right? Oh, it's already... Oh, this is tan and off? So we are in this ancient warehouse with Peyton, my new friend. He has sold me a whole bunch of goodies for the Z. He had the trans mount, drive shaft, and a couple of random interior pieces that I was looking for. And he's got a whole bunch of other parts. So if you need parts for a Z, let him know. Just let me know, man. I got... You see it. I got a lot. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to start working on the motor. This K8 that I pulled is very stock. It has all the stock emissions still on it, which are not going to remain. This whole thing just comes off together. But I do have two open ports still. I have this one here, which is attached to the intake manifold. But I also have the fuel pressure regulator open still. And I would like that to be attached to the intake manifold. So it works out perfect that just these two ports are open still. We've got a nice little delete pile started. And since this was pulled from an automatic S13, we're going to need to take off this flywheel because it will not work with a manual. But I'm also noticing the rear main seal is definitely leaking. There's oil puddled all along the bottom here. I have a new OEM one ready to go. I got everything cleaned up all nice. I pressed in the brand new rear main seal. Listen to how old and hard this thing is. It's like a solid piece of plastic now. I also picked up this adapter plate that you can use to make the 300ZX transmission to the KA. Now with this adapter plate, you will be able to run the stock KA clutch. And also we're gonna have to make some modifications on the transmission itself. It's riding shotgun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dang it. This thing is gunked up. 
Oh my god. I bet this engine has never been cleaned. We wanted to pressure wash it and clean it off. We reeled out the hose. It was so frozen that the hose ripped and there wasn't even water coming out of it because it's still 30 degrees outside. So unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to hose this down right now. But that's okay because we're just trying to get it running. I decided that the rear end of this motor is a little bit too gunked up to be putting a very nice plate on there. To spray along here as well. And these bottom brackets too. Got the back of the engine very nicely cleaned up. Good enough for now. All of our points are nice and dry. No grime or grease on them. I just remembered I'm gonna have to clean out the inside of the transmission now. This is really nasty too. I think we can all agree that this looks much better. Now we're good to finally test mount this plate. It should just go on the back here. I'm already hitting a coolant hose. So we have to probably relocate that. So these are the two lower bolt holes that we're going to drill through. It fits in here already, but I do want to expand it to the correct dimension that it is calling for. All right, we have our lower holes drilled out to 13 millimeters. Now we need to find this dowel pin right here and we need to trim it down to six millimeters. We'll take our measuring device. Well, it looks like we don't have to trim very much off, but it's nice to check how far six millimeters is before grinding. Six. Before we put these in, we have to use thread locker. The trans adapter plate fully mounted onto the engine and torqued down. The very next steps are to inspect the new flywheel. So I've taken apart the clutch disc from the flywheel. It says that there needs to be a bevel grinded into the opposite side of the teeth since the starter is going to be engaging on the opposite side now. But luckily this flywheel is actually beveled on both sides. So we don't need to do that step, which is great. The very next step is to verify that the flywheel spacer fits onto the crank. And some automatic crankshafts have this little spacer on it. And since this came out of an automatic S13, it looks like we have a little spacer gapped out. We have the tool, but we did move everything into the garage because the sun is about to set and it's getting really cold out here. You're not gonna believe how I got it out. I tried using this tool a couple more times and it kept slipping off of the edge. So I actually had to grind down the very tips of this so they'd be sharper and it would have a stronger grab on this pilot bushing. We're getting ready to put the flywheel on and these come with some grease when they ship them. That's just so they don't surface rust. So you gotta spray it off. A nice little rag. Now it's ready to go. We'll have to do this to the pressure plate as well. And I'm just making sure that they all bottom out without any issues. Because since we're using a flywheel spacer and custom bolts, I want to make sure that everything lines up before I go ahead and put red Loctite on here. I have now verified these bolts fit perfectly and they bottom out on the flywheel before the threads bottom out on the crank. The next step is going to be taking them out one at a time and installing the thread locker. Boom, 80. Very next step on the directions is to mount the clutch disc to the alignment tool and test fit it onto the flywheel and verify that the springs, these are the springs, are not hitting those flywheel bolts on the inside. And I'm not hearing any metal to metal. I'll take it off so you can see how far these bolts come out. This is what they do in performance shops. You kind of leave a line on the outside along the washer and on the bolt. This is how you will know if the bolt was spinning off, if the torque spec was incorrect, or if the bolt failed. Twenty-two foot pounds. And just like before, we tighten it down in a star sequence, and now I am drawing my torque lines. The very next step in the directions say that we need to clearance the transmission for the starter. There's a nice little template here. And what this describes is this outline here. It's bright enough that it'll shine through. These bolt locations are lined up and you can see I need to shave off about four to five millimeters here. All right, we've grinded this nice notch out of here. It's nice and smoothed out. Got a little bit more clearance. Let's test fit this starter and see how it fits. The starter is fully mounted, tightened, 
into position. You can see the teeth on the inside here now. So the best way to pry back the teeth to see if it'll fit is just pull down. In its most maxed out state, it is not even coming close to the trans anymore. I think it definitely would have hit this if I didn't trim this off. Next up is test fitting dowel pins. So we need to put dowel pins in here and one in here. And then after those dowel pins are in, all we have to do is put the transmission onto the engine. It is very strange seeing a starter bolted to a transmission like this. Most cars, if not all cars I've worked on, the starter bolts to the engine, just like the KA here. Goes in here. And while we have this out, we might as well grease all of our pivot points. I have wiped off all of our grease points. They're all nice and clean. Anything that's shiny, grease it on up. About a half hour to an hour later, we finally wiggled this thing on. It was not being cooperative with us, but we got it. We got it. <laughs> what we need to do first is move the Z into a better spot on the driveway, and then we can work on dropping the new engine and transmission into the car for the very first time. Well, Nate's getting us all strapped up onto the tow truck slash work truck, but we are going to now try and tow this out and into the street, right? This tire is almost done filling up. It always loses air. Oh, perfect timing. Slight change of plans. We are actually driving down the street to a school to do a U-turn. So this might be unofficially my very first test drive in the car. It's so sketchy how close I am to the Integra. Yo, that went pretty smoothly, actually. <laughs> well, how was it driving? It was it? fun. It was a lot of fun. I can't wait to drive this thing. That worked out perfectly. Though. It did. That went really smoothly. <laughs> Honestly, it didn't like feel that much of a drag. Oh, really? Yeah. It didn't like slow it down that much? Not that much. Yeah. It's a work truck, baby. <laughs> That's why it's Plus meant. All shit yeah, this here. thing is loaded up on top of it. What I brought today was the welding gas, some extra metal in case we need it to make some custom motor mounts, and then just the average tools that we always have. Now we have to move the engine and the engine hoist down the driveway and into the Z. Oh, there we go. Before I hook up this engine to the hoist, there are a couple things that I just remembered I need to do on the engine still. For example, number one, I need to delete this EGR port. I could just make a block off plate for it, but I don't have any flat scrap metal here. So what I'm gonna do instead is just weld it shut. Now I'd rather take this little piece off the engine before welding this hole, because I would hate to have slag fall down into this hole, into the intake manifold, and then blow up the engine on the first startup. Very next thing I want to do on the engine is take off this engine bracket. We're going to need to go find some 300ZX engine brackets and see if those line up on here. I'm back to visit my friend Peyton because I knew he would have the motor mounts that I needed. We got them here over at the uh, old Z shop. The Z shop. We're just going to take off the actual hard mounts to the engine and then it comes with this rubber mount which looks like it's in good condition still which is exactly what we're looking for. We got them off. Dang, what's going on with this one, dude? Hey, you know, we're starting the uh, beginning, middle stages of the bodywork area of this Nissan 300ZX. You want to respray mine next? Hey, I'm all for it, man. Bring it, bring it to paint and paints. We'll get it done. Thanks again for the mounts, man. <laughs> I don't think these VG mounts are going to line up on the KA. <laughs> they look very different. Yeah, no. <laughs> How about this side? No, not at all. Well, with that being said, we're going to have to modify the KA mount to work. But I do want to try and utilize the stock VG rubber bushings. So we'll take those off of the hard mounts, which are actually aluminum, so I can't even weld to this. And we'll try and see if we can mate that to the KA. So this is the mount that we will be modifying. I don't know if they're different from driver's side to passenger side. Well, we're trying to think ahead here at, you know, best operations, because we're going to have to be welding this mount while it's in the car. And this AC is kind of in the way. I do eventually want to run AC because I think that'd be really cool. But for now, we're going to have to take it off so that I have more access to weld the mount. Oh, yeah. 
if we zip tie this drive shaft yoke into the transmission because there's actually still a transmission fluid in here this is exciting it's getting ready to go in just remembered we also need to put back the egr port we took off so i'm just gonna wire wheel the surface down that mates to the intake manifold that way it's nice and clean because there's some old gasket on there i don't have a new gasket so i'm gonna use rtv for now i'm not too worried about that it should be fine and then i'm also going to remove the rubber mounts from the stock 300 zx motor mounts and put them on the subframe directly i'll mount them in a way that they're not cranked down but in a way that they have some wiggle room in case we need to make some adjustments just like you'd install any motor into a car I think these are the same for both sides. So let's check real quick. I don't see any markings. Yeah, these are definitely the same. Another thing I noticed while inspecting the subframe, so this is the location where the engine mounts go. They are actually not parallel. The passenger side, left-hand drive, mount is farther forward than the driver's side. You can kind of see how that's in line with the rack. And this one is about an inch or so pushed forward. That makes me wonder if the KA mounts are offset but either way, we're gonna have to compensate for that if they are not. Before we drop everything in there, let's make sure that these rubber mounts actually fit into the KA mount. Oh my gosh, it does. And the stud lines up. Did you see it lock in there? The stud goes on top. We'll have to bolt those on. How is the power steering mounted here if it doesn't even fit? Yeah, oh, yeah. it's supposed to be this way, but still. Yeah, so what the heck? It's pouring! Oh. It's hailing! What? Holy crap! This is the worst time for that. Actually, no. It's not the worst time for that to happen. We were almost <laughs> about to be mid hoist. Yeah. <laughs> Sky high in right? that motor. Yeah. Hear how hard it's hitting the car? <laughs> Seriously. I might have to pry down that power steering line. I don't know if the previous owner adjusted it or something we put the car up in the air so we can put jack stands under it and then get to the motor mount bolts from the bottom but i just remembered i put the jack stands up on the engine to hold it up and before we bring it back up i wanted to change out this transmission mount because it's crusty and blown it's not even attached to anything anymore it's completely ripped off and nate's work truck storage unit has our trans mount or i guess this isn't the trans mount but this is the cross member brace got the master cylinder this time and then we went with a nismo transmission mount the nismo mount basically looks the same except that there's more rubber yeah so this is a lot more stiff than the stock one crusty it's still on there how is it stuck i thought there's only two bolts Oh my gosh! I never understood why manufacturers put a literal weight on these things. This is heavy. Feel that. Okay. Instant weight reduction if you ask me. This is a lot lighter. <laughs> oh. But it does go on this way. I just, well, this way. I was just going to slap this mount right on there. But after looking at how crusty this mounting surface is, I'm actually going to use the wire wheel and clean that surface up. All right, that's much cleaner. Now we need to get the old rubber mount off of the cross member. So I was trying to decide which way this cross member trans mount goes because you can kind of tell these two mounts are not in the center point of these three studs. So I can't tell if it gets mounted in the car this way or this way. But we have another Z here that is manual. And Nate slid his phone under there. And we were able to determine, based on his video, <laughs> that the bolts are trailing. So the open end with the trailing bolts go towards the rear. So we're mounting this up. And Nate's like, yo, there's an arrow on this. There's actually an arrow that says front. So we were right. That's honestly really nice. A lot of parts do not come like that. but. Thank you, Nissan. Well, it got a little too dark out, so we are going to resume tomorrow, which is today. We did end up getting this mount in a location that is free. It is close to the power steering line, but it is not touching it when fully mounted.
We have the motor mounts ready to go. I wanted to make sure that I have the trans mount bolts ready to go. We have the work truck here. So here's the nuts and here's the bolts. All right, so right off the bat, this looks like a trans mount bolt. So I'm going to confirm that this fits in the trans mount holes. Oh yeah, that's perfect. Need to find one, two, three, four, five more of those. A quick way to check if the threads are the same with a random bolt is you can put them opposite to each other. And you can see the threads match up. No gap. And we have the KA skyrocketed at this point. <laughs> Ready to go in. And we couldn't find any moving blankets. I forgot to bring them. But we are going to use the trunk carpet for the Z. So that'll work. But I don't think we'll have an issue because <laughs> it's so high up. And we also put the wheelie cart on the bottom here so that when we drop the transmission in, it's going to hit this wheelie cart and push itself back. Yeah, I think I think that's good. All right, I guess we're ready to go down a little bit. I don't know why I thought we were going to be able to fit this transmission in here without taking off the shifter itself. There we go. We snapped three out of the four bolts that held this onto the transmission because they were so rusty. Great. Need a whole nother shift linkage now. This is our very first test fit of the KA. There's no tension on this, as you can see. And it does not fit very well. We are actually sitting directly onto power steering lines. So our plan of attack right now is to take off the power steering lines, the hard lines that run under the car. As you can see, they're hitting. Well, that was pretty easy actually. Although this is the bigger fitting on the rack, this is actually the return line. May or may not need this later, so we'll keep that. Now we gotta get the other side off. There it is. It's like a lot more clearance now. We're ready to go back down. Well, it's definitely lower than before. That's a good start. We still, yeah, we still have to go back. It's just gonna sit on the subframe, I think. Yeah, the transmission mount is about level with how high up it needs to be. But by the looks of it, the KA oil pan is already sitting on the rack and subframe. We decided it's time to take off the bumper so we can push the hoist in farther. We pushed it forward a little bit and the stud actually fell into the hole of this side. But that one's nowhere close. But we're gonna check and see how far the trans mount still is. Even with the bumper off, we still are not able to push the engine back as far as it needs to go. It was bottoming out on the bash bar. I've never seen a bash bar have rods that go that far into the frame rail. But wow, look at all that clearance now. Man, I think the oil pan is actually going to come in contact with the subframe. I would much rather notch the subframe than I would the oil pan. I'm going to try my best to get the transmission mounted. That way I can 100% confirm how far in this KA has to be. And then I'll draw some lines in the subframe if it is touching and go from there. And yes, there's only two bolts on here for now out of three. But that's okay, we're not clutch kicking the car we're just letting it sit in there for a second basically what we had to do was lift up the front of the engine high enough to clear the oil pan i wanted to make sure that we mount the transmission correctly so that we know the distance we need to notch the subframe which doesn't look like too much actually most of it is this extra extendo neck here can't see much from this angle let's try oh this is a this is the money shot we need to cut back about half an inch. All right, just tried to wipe up as much grease off of this subframe as I could. Grab this marker here, and the oil pan goes out to here. So this is the exact line. This is not the cut line. Same with this side. Oil pan goes to about here. We want to make sure that we cut it wider than this. Now this looks a little extreme, but I will show you what I have in mind. And I will mark this one differently. That way I know not to cut this one. This is just a reference line. This came out with such ease. Now how is this leaking? It's not even running. All right, I have made the cut lines. Now I'm going to try and explain how I came about this. Everything that's filled in is basically what's going to be removed. There's one straight cut line here and one straight cut line here. I'm gonna cut off this tiny section first, remove it, cut off the outlined filled in section. Then I'll be able to reinstall the smaller piece forward. 
If you've previously seen me relocate my 240SX rack on the channel, that's the same principle, except we're not relocating the rack forward, we're actually pushing back the front of the subframe. So it's the same concept, but a different application. The first part. Oh my god, dude, yeah, you got it cut out. So yeah. what, what's going on up here? I'm just prepping the metal right now, and I'm about to weld it back together. Actually, we'll do it right now. You ready? Boom. All right, well, I guess we can test fit it now. It's only tacked into position. I want to make sure this fits before I weld all the way across everything and need to cut it again. There we right, go. Maybe. It's got to be like... Yeah, slightly like, turned, and it worked perfectly. Kind of like... All right, we got the transmission mounted. Let's check how the oil pan clearance is to the subframe now. Oh my god, that's like too close for comfort. Oh, it's hitting. No. Yeah. We're going to probably have to massage the oil pan just a little bit more. Well, actually, I didn't massage the oil pan yet. That could work. But this already looks better. No, it's so close. Do you want to let go of it all the way so we can see how it'll fully sit on there? And it'll leave a nice line on the oil pan of where it's hitting. A witness mark, as Mike would say. A witness mark. Oh, there he goes, dude. <laughs> it's such a funny sound. <laughs> well, the clearance to the subframe and the oil pan is a lot better. I honestly thought this swap would be a lot easier. Putting a four-cylinder in a car that originally has a V6. Plus, people have done SR swaps, but I guess this is why the KA swap has not been done. So, our very next step is going to be pulling out the engine yet again. We have to make custom motor mounts. We're going to have to bridge from the block to the car itself. There she goes. This is where the rack and pinion sits on the 240. You can see the indent here on the oil pan that allows for that clearance. This is where it is sitting currently on the Z. I drew a little line here. We're going to try and massage this out just a little bit. Going back in. All right, let's lower the engine and see where we sit now. Honestly, that already looks a lot lower. Yeah, it looks a lot Oh, dude, that's perfect. So right now, the oil pan is below the subframe, which is good. That's what we want. That means we can lift up the engine ever so slightly and then weld the mounts in place. The oil pan is supposed to be level with the subframe from the factory. Not that this came from the factory, but that's just how these pans and cars are designed. All right, just go up ever so slightly. So there we go. So now we're free. Let's see how far away the mounts are now. This is going to be really fun to make in here. Really should have taken the intake manifold out first. This won't be too bad though. It's just right here. And lastly, we'll check the clearances to the rack. Much better. I would stick my fingers in there, but I'm not going to. So we've determined the correct height of the KA. Now we need to make some measurements to make sure it's centered in the car. Although it may look centered, I like to verify 100%. The transmission has this ridge right on the bottom. That signifies the center of the trans. Luckily, we have a nice center point to measure from. So not only do we need to verify the distance between the midpoint and the frame rail are the same on both sides, but we also need to make sure it's clocked correctly. Because right now, when looking at it from the front, you can kind of tell that it is clocked towards the right. What we need to do is jack it in a way that it's turned to the left half an inch maybe less than half an inch and then measure the distance between the frame rail and the midpoint of the tram you're gonna measure from that frame rail to this frame rail and then take the midpoint looks like we got about 35 inches nate what's half of 35 <laughs> okay so the midpoint has to be 17 and a half oh we're close can you push the engine towards the driver's side oh wait maybe the passenger side right there Hold it for a second, that's where it needs to be. Now you just gotta sit there and hold it for the next hour while I make these motor mounts. So I have just prepped the metal on the engine mount. I've completely bolted and tightened these on to the block and the rubber mount for the Z. So now what I wanna do is grab some metal like this, nicely prepped, cut it to shape. I'm gonna put the first layer on the inside. Then I can unbolt it from the car and finish the welds from the inside. I'm gonna have to remeasure the transmission to make sure it's centered. 17 and a half, right? I think we are good. Yeah, it's right on the money. 
All right, we finally have this side somewhat welded in. It's not completely welded because we can't get every angle with the engine still in the car. So this will at least do for now. Now we need to start welding the other side, but unfortunately it's gonna be really hard to show, film, and explain because it's not really visible. So I went ahead and just tacked everything into position and took it off. And this is what we came up with. It looks very not good right now. But that's because I could barely reach the welder in there. So I just try to tack it into position for now. We actually ended up using an Integra tow hook. That is what this piece is right here. I wonder which Integra this came off of. I'm gonna add this arm to this side. This is 16 gauge metal. And then all these little gussets, I'm gonna fill in these corners. After some welding and grinding, this is what we came up with. Not too bad. This thing is honestly really beefy for what it is. And it'll definitely hold the KA in there, no problem. All right, let's drop it down, see how she sits. We will have to reinforce this eventually, but just for sitting in here, I think that's fine. She's in there. Let's check the clearances. Oil pan looks good. It's not hitting the rack either. I think we nailed it. It's official, the KA is in the Z. Now for the moment of truth. Will it clear with the hood closed? Shoo! <laughs> Pretty free too. I don't feel it like pressing up on anything. Before I get too ahead of myself, I'm going to reinforce this mount. Before I take it off of the car, I'm going to use this tiny piece of metal to bridge the top. That way when I'm reinforcing it with the sticker metal here, it won't warp making these two points uneven. All right, let's make this look pretty. Oh, it's all done. She's in. The mounts are officially done. I did spray some paint in the crevices in here. I do plan on getting this powder coated eventually, but again, the goal right now is just to get this engine started to make sure it's worth putting more money into. So today I'm gonna to be converting my KA engine harness to fit the 300ZX chassis harness. Now I do still have the original 300ZX engine harness in here. And that's only because we couldn't get it out last time. Apparently there's a little plate you have to remove to remove it fully from the firewall, but we'll get to that later. So I'll show you the plugs that we're working with today. These are gonna be the most important ones. And these are the three main engine plugs and they attach right here. Now the KA has similar plugs, although not three, there's only two. And these are the two plugs that go onto the KA harness. So essentially this harness is gonna have to connect over here somehow. Originally on the 240, it connects on this side of the car, but we'll go through all that later. What's important right now is to figure out what pins from these two connectors I need to line up to the pins in these three connectors. Now the very first thing I notice is that this brown plug actually fits in here. No problem. Only one out of the eight pins is in the correct location. And you're probably wondering how I figured that out. Well, the very first thing I did was grab the sheet of paper and wrote down every single pin color on each connector and labeled it. So for example, I have the 300ZX stuff on top, 240 stuff on the bottom. I started with just drawing out the pins, labeling them. Also, I made sure to write the back view so that way when you're looking at the connector, it's in this order. See how green is on the top left? Versus if you look at it this way, green would be on the top right. So that's very important. And then once I drew the connectors, I labeled each pin and then wrote down what color each wire was. And then I spent hours looking through forums and electrical diagrams to try and find out any information on what these wires actually go to. Sounds very easy to find a diagram, but the thing is this is a connector within a diagram. This isn't the end point. Basically what that means is I had to trace every single wire color, find out where it starts from, where it goes, and what it goes through. So once I figured that out, I wrote down a brief description on what the wire does. And then I did that for the 240 as well. So now what I'm doing is comparing the 240 KA harness to the 300ZX VG harness. I'm trying to find any similarities between the two, and so far I have come up with quite a few. I may or may not have enough connections to get the engine started right away. So before I go chopping up my harness, I'm gonna back probe each wire and jump it to the Z. But before I even do that, I'm gonna plug a battery into the Z and just make sure the car works as it should. Basically I'll you know try and roll the windows down, 
try and turn the ignition on, see if the lights work on the cluster. That way we know the chassis is good before we start messing around with the engine harness. And we're gonna have to grab the battery out of the work truck. Well, we got the battery in there, but I'm realizing this car doesn't even have terminals. The KA harness that I have does have terminals. For example, this was off of the Junkyard KA, which is attached to the transmission harness. So I might just separate this from the KA harness for now because the starter and battery locations are in different spots on these cars. For example, the 240 battery is right here, which is why this only goes here. But on this car, battery positive is right here and the starter is right below it. Positive terminal came off very nicely and it's still got the original fitting on there for the starter. Now I wanna clean up some of the stuff in here because I can't get to the wiring down here. I believe the single pin connector is the starter signal. There's also cruise control and whatever this is in the way. So we're just gonna do some quick deletes on the car. Like this air ducting, we don't need that right now. The bay feels like it has so much more room already. I probably should have deleted most of this stuff before we went about putting the engine in there. And another thing is this little wire has to go to the positive terminal, which I just realized this battery is in backwards. The positive is supposed to be on this side. I'm gonna go ahead and attach the starter wire. Man, it's so close to the firewall. The nice thing here is there's no exhaust manifold in the way like there would be if this was a VG. So it was my mistake not to bring a negative terminal here. So we ended up finding an old Integra positive harness. Well, here's something. No major spark, so I think we're good to test fit this for now. And yes, this is vice script because I tried to tighten this terminal and it broke off. Let's see what the car does. It's got some power. Again, we don't have these powered up yet because I don't have the other side of this connector. The windows work? Oh my gosh. Do the lights work? Oh yeah, look at that. Oh what? That's how you turn it off? That's pretty nifty. You're gonna have to learn how to use this car. That's pretty neat. Is this fog lights? What is this? We're gonna take out the key for now just so we don't have ignition on. Can't forget to put the filter on. And we did fill this filter about halfway with oil. I want to verify all the voltages that I have written down on here on each pin. So basically what I'm doing is grabbing the multimeter, setting it to voltage, grabbing a lead and touching each pin inside of these three connectors. And I'll have the ground side, which I was using this motor bracket here since it's bare and it's a good ground. Then after I complete this step, I'm gonna turn the ignition on and then check all the pins again, just to verify the operation during ignition on. Then I will go about jumping the 240KA pins into the 300ZX body pins. This is gonna look a little crazy. That's because it is. We've gotten to the point where most of the pins are jumped that I believe are necessary for starting the car. I was looking around in my Integra because I have my wiring stuff in there. This is actually the 240 starter connector. So you won't believe this, but it fits in the Z. Look at that, meant to be. So I will just slide this onto the starter. I will probably have to go under there and do that. I think I'm just gonna crank over and see if the starting system works. Should probably a neutral check, but... <laughs> there we go. All right, here we go. Nothing. I think we have to bypass the neutral safety switch. So let's find out where that is. <laughs> Apparently, there is a starter control relay thing behind this panel. Ah, there it is. Apparently you have to jump these two, which makes sense because this is the color of the starter signal wire, black with a yellow stripe. So we have this little jumper. We'll slide it in. Let's try that out. <laughs> Make sure nothing blows up in there. I don't know if you guys heard that or not, but I definitely heard something knocking. I don't know if that's the engine itself. Before we pull the engine completely out of the car, let's check the crank. Oh, see, like right here, I can feel it grinding on something. I don't know how to explain it. Oh, right, right there, it's stuck, it's sticking. I did spin this motor a couple revolutions at the junkyard before I pulled it, and it was fine. You jack this up a little bit, and then we'll disconnect the trans mount. Well, we got the engine out this far. And the hoist decided to stop working. The easiest way to go about this is just picking it up and just... There we go. Oh my gosh, so satisfying when things work the way they should. 
since we filled this up with brand new oil, we're gonna drain it, hopefully into this container without making any mess. I did put a pan under it and cardboard just in case. And it's nice and leveled out. All right, we drained most of the oil out of here. Now we gotta take off these side brackets. I'm gonna spin this engine by hand and inspect if there's any marks on the crank or the rod studs. I don't know, something doesn't feel right. It's like really notchy. And there should be no resistance since there's no spark plugs in there. Free, 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 hit. While it's hitting, I was trying to listen around to see if I could hear where it was coming from. And I think it's actually coming from inside the transmission. So I'm gonna try and put the camera in here so you can listen. I'm wondering if the clutch is hitting the bell housing. Okay, now let's check if there's any witness marks going on inside the transmission or on the clutch. Oh, look at that. That's shiny right there. What was that grinding on? The starter. Look, right there. No way. I would have never guessed the pressure plate on the clutch was grinding on the starter. Let's try and spin the engine just to confirm. This should be nice and free. Yeah, see, that's how it should be. Should I grind down the starter? There's really no other option here. I'm not about to grind down the clutch. What a crazy find. All right, we have shaved just a little bit off the starter. We have the bottom of the block nicely prepped. This looks great. All right, we've got the oil pan on here. We have a nice seal oozing all the way around. So now we can test fit the transmission again, bolt it up and make sure that the clutch is not hitting the starter. As weird as that sounds. All right, we have the transmission mounted yet again. Now we'll spin this and it should be free because we still don't have spark plugs back in it. I don't hear anything going on over here. But back in the car it goes. The pins are now jumped and I followed my diagram. Now my very next step is to plug in the ECU. And also there's an igniter and a coil that needs to be plugged in as well as the MAF, which I have a whole bunch of parts here. I have a 28 ECU, KA dual cam, and we have a coil and an igniter. Additionally, I have pigtails for the 300ZX engine harness and the KA engine harness, so that when I figure out if this is the correct wiring, I can just have this as a plug and play sub harness. I went ahead and connected some accessories, got the intake on, ECU plugged in, and the igniter chip. I just remembered I don't have spark plugs for this engine, and I'm definitely not going to put these back in it. got most of the stuff hooked up and I'm going to attach power so that we can verify what pins I need to jump to run the fuel pump because we don't have the stock 300ZX ECU to power on the fuel pump. It is exciting to hear the car alive <laughs> but we need to remove everything out of the back seat so that I can get to the fuel pump. Photo. We found out that the fuel pump is not under the back seat. It is under the spare tire. So I found a pinout for what each wire color does and determined that the orange is power and the white is ground. Now it grounds out to a fuel pump relay module, which we're not gonna mess with today. We are just jumping straight power and ground to the fuel pump. So let's see if it even turns on. Ooh. I don't know how much fuel is in this though. Let's check if there's any leaks. No leaks. Could also be no fuel. <laughs> so fresh, so clean. <laughs> wow. This is our first initial test start. Going to ground the fuel pump to the trunk latch. Go ahead, Tim, crank her over. Well, obviously it didn't start, but we're thinking we needed to ground the ignition coil and the igniter as well as the igniter ground because that's how it is on the 240. So we're gonna do that and then try again. Okay, we moved some wires around. We found out that the ECU was not getting power. So we're gonna try this again. We got the fuel pump, we got Tim cranking it. Go ahead. No! I can start 
start spraying some degreaser in here so I can really clean the bay up. Actually, before I get ahead of myself, let me weld the subframe first. And that looks pretty good. That looks very nice. Officially coat the entire engine bay purple power. And it can also do that to the engine as well. We got the engine bay and the KA cleaned up. Superb. This looks so fresh. Oh my gosh. Almost factory fresh. There are some paint chips, so it's not going to be perfect. Man, this engine looks so much cleaner in here now. Looks the same to me. This thing looks really clean on the inside. Put this on here. Pretty cool. Can't wait to see this on the car. Pick these guys off. Oh, this is going to be fun. Well, unfortunately, it looks like the exhaust is hitting the floorboard here. So we're going to take off the downpipe and then just try and fit the header on its own. Might as well put these on real quick. If we mount this in the way of our clutch master, that's going to be a headache down the line. It even says Nissan on the side. I didn't know that. I've never seen anything like this before. It's like a gasket, but it also has these spacers in it. That is to bore out this hole. So glad I grabbed it. Since we're working with the clutch line, we might as well put on a new slave cylinder now. Now that we figured out the fuel lines, I think the very next thing I want to do is see if the stock 300ZX VG30 throttle cable will work on this KA. Honestly, I think this is going to work no problem. This fits perfectly. That's a nice fit. The next thing I want to figure out is the radiator and can I run a cooling fan? The KA cooling fan. Got a brand new coil radiator. I'm already noticing the bottom coolant port is on the right side. And I think the KA is supposed to be on the same side. Got one here and then the other outlet is here. I'm used to on 240s, you're able to pull the radiator flush with the core support, but it looks like we have a harness that sticks out too far. But luckily we have another Z here to go off of for reference. Oh yeah, it's definitely gapped out. Although I did the Wiggling the fan on, it's already a great sign. Wow, it's actually perfect. You can actually put your hand in between it. Now I mentioned I wanted to make a jumper harness, which basically would entail no wires being cut between the two harnesses. Throughout my recent junkyard hauls, I found these connectors. These are from a 300ZX. So these are actually the engine harness plugs from a Z. These two are from an S13 KA. This is also from the engine room harness. So these will plug in to the KA harness. Boom, connectors match, and then we match the wires. Now the wire colors are not gonna be the same for what the wires do. The clutch system is fully bled. The next thing we wanna do is put on the drive shaft. All right, we laid some towels down just in case some fluid comes out, but we're gonna try and make this as quick as possible. Oh, no fluid so far. So let's slap this alternator in and then connect the harness. It goes all the way down there. Where did it go? Oh, it's already on there. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to install the belt onto the alternator because I cannot find the water pump pulley. We don't need that to drive around the block, do we? Now, this car still is kind of a mission to start. First thing we got to do, plug in the terminal. And the power to run the entire engine is coming from this horn fuse. But there's no radiator, no speed sensor, no coolant sensor, no coolant, no reverse lights, no exhaust, no bolts holding in the front end, no alternator, no battery hold down, no air filter. But other than those few things, this car is ready to rock. And lastly, we need to jump the fuel pump. Okay, now it's ready to start. First try. Success, it moves. For some reason, I thought the water pump pulley was on the same belt as the alternator. Well, that's not true. The water pump actually shares a belt with the power steering. Now that's kind of unfortunate because we don't have power steering at the moment. And I haven't even made the lines for the power steering. So in order to really drive this car reliably, I need to figure out the power steering situation as well. A couple main parts to a power steering system. Got the pump, reservoir, pressure line, rack and pinion. I would ideally like to put the reservoir pretty close to the pump. On the Z's, they're supposed to go on the opposite side because the pump is on this side of the engine bay. All right, we have the power steering pump mounted to the KA. 
that I also went ahead and installed the pressure line from the 300ZX engine, actually. So with this being a Z pressure line, that's why it comes out on this side. I'm gonna see if I can make this work for now. It looks like this fitting might actually work on there. This is pretty crazy. I fully bolted on the power steering line from the 300ZX. I looped it around this way to the KA pump. This is the stock 300ZX hose that goes from the power steering reservoir to the pump. I wanted to show you, there it is on the bottom there. See how that lines up? Perfectly lines up here. It's like it was meant to be. Now we have to figure out the return side. This goes directly to the rack, goes under the motor mount and comes out about here. So we're gonna have to connect this port down to there. Meanwhile, I can hook up the alternator belt belt is good finally got the belt just slap around now before i tension this belt i have to put on the fan the clutch fan is what bolts in that water pump pulley so without it bolted in it's not going to tension correctly basically just spin this adjustment let's install the power steering return hose right now nate is working on looping the coolant hoses in the back the heater core lines and I am starting to solder our wires together. And I also placed heat shrink on all of the wires we will not be using at this moment. We have our harness done for now. The next step is honestly putting in the radiator. As for the radiator hoses, we have 300ZX lower and 240SX upper. So I'm gonna trim it back right around here. Next is filling up concentrate coolant, which means we have to use distilled water, 50-50 mix. Get that nice and topped off. And these radiators don't come with caps. Hopefully the cap fits on the work truck. Skunk 2 cap. <laughs> it works. Oh, more fluid? Oh, yeah, it was empty almost. Yeah. Well, last night we weren't able to close the hood because of the intake situation. So today we're going to retry that. And I have the work truck here loaded up with some parts. These are actually intercooler pipes off of my brother's Skyline. And I brought my welder, grinder, and drill this time in case we need to make anything custom. All right, here's what I came up with. So going off the throttle body, the starting point, we have the 240SX intake coupler. We have a Skyline 90 degree bend. We have an aftermarket 90 degree bend coupler. We have the stock Z32 crazy intake pipe that goes under the headlight to here. It does have these two open ports that I'm gonna have to close up. Another coupler and then the 240 MAF. So I guess technically now it's a cold air intake since it's outside the engine bay. So thankfully I'm able to use the first coupler because I can utilize that fitting for the valve cover breather. But then I'm gonna have to figure out where I'm gonna put this hose. This is actually the idle air control valve. So I'm starting to look through the scrap bin we have here and I came across these two. These two are actually exhaust hangers. This actually looks like it'll fit into the idle air control valve hose. Oh my gosh, that's actually gonna work. I don't know if this is jank or just pure ingenuity. We're gonna use an exhaust hanger as an intake port. We got our two pipes welded up. Welded on some plates. Then we got the Skyline angled piece with the exhaust hanger. Why does that actually look legit though? Now we just gotta throw it on the car, make sure everything fits. So far so good with all of our clamps here, but now for the moment of truth. Will our idle air control valve hose actually work? It is going on. I mean, it'll even work just like that, but I'm gonna put it on a little bit more. Well, now we should probably start this thing up and make sure there are not any leaks within any of these welds that we made. And we also never checked if the alternator works. I guess I can take it around the block now, like actually, although it is kind of loud without the exhaust attached, but I do want to put the front end on first. Can't be that ratchet. We need, we need at least a complete car if it's that loud. Last but not least, our Skunk 2 radiator cap. Sounds really good. <laughs> so sick. I made that. Basically out of scrap. The 300ZX was a part out car that I bought off a guy. It was like halfway parted out. The KA I got out of a junkyard car. The transmission I got out of a junkyard Z car. 
and everything else I just kind of found and pieced together. I mean, you guys just saw, I literally made an intake port out of an exhaust hanger. Just quit worrying about what people have to say about you and just go have fun. Cause they're probably not having fun if they're hating on you. What'd you think? Dude, this thing is really smooth. Right? I need to make an exhaust for the car. This is the exhaust that came with the car. And on the bottom, it says, Bro speed. This downpipe is designed to fit the manifold that's on the KA right now. And we already verified that it will not fit the Z. This upper portion of the pipe actually hits the floorboard. I also picked up this exhaust last night from Peyton. So we got two big old mufflers, but it has the mid pipe and also the downpipe. Let's lay all this out so we have a better idea of what we're working with. So I have laid out our two options, which I think we're gonna combine them into one option. We have the KA downpipe with the aftermarket exhaust that came with the car. This is about how much of the exhaust is actually missing. That's about the size of a catalytic converter. So this is the stock 300ZX NA driver side downpipe, which I'm not too confident is gonna line up exactly to the KA header, but we're gonna find out. And it actually has the flanges that bolt directly to the mid pipe and down to the stock mufflers. But I would like to use at least this downpipe with the cat and maybe even this, I think this is an H pipe they said. I think it'd be cool to have quad tips on a KA because then when people are behind the Z, they would not expect anything. Car is up in the air. Let's test fit this down pipe. This flange is at the incorrect orientation. None of the studs line up. I'm gonna have to chop this down pipe, rotate it. Now, before I go about chopping up this down pipe, I wanna mount the rest of the stock exhaust onto the car because if I have this on the car, I'll know exactly where this flange needs to be and I can line this flange up. And then I'll be able to line up that chopped off section where it needs to go. So that means I need to tack weld at least this back together. It's kind of rusty and I'm gonna have to go over some of these welds. And now I'm using the stock one and not the aftermarket exhaust because these hangers were cut off and obviously there's no flange on the end of this, so it would be pointless. Got this little guy capped up. Put a little smiley face on him. Now we need to jack up the center of the exhaust, but before I do that, I want to clean off some of this gasket. All right, we are ready to go up. So with the exhaust fully jacked up to where it needs to be, this is exactly how the flange sits. So it looks like we're gonna have to modify the Z flange to have less of a slope. Cause right now it's like basically 90. It sucks because I ordered a flex pipe to weld onto here, but it didn't show up in time. So we're gonna have to do that later on top of this. I think I'm gonna start by making a cut right around here. All right, so we've got our flange cut. Now I'm going to fully mount this onto the exhaust manifold. All right, now we will jack up the exhaust once again, and we will see how much of a gap we need to fill. This is about where we need to be, and that's honestly not too bad. That's all we need to fill. Let's cut up some of the aftermarket exhaust. I'm thinking maybe this slightly angled piece will be perfect. Now this is the easiest part. Now that we have our little section that we want to use, you just line it up. There we go. It's done. I also went ahead and took off the rest of the heat shield because I felt like that was gonna be a future rattle. It was already starting to rattle just handling it. Oh, it's so quiet. There is a slight exhaust leak though. I definitely hear it coming from right here. Not bad. Oh, right here, literally right on the gasket. I don't even feel a leak on this one at all. Is the exhaust coming out evenly on both tips? Primary side. Dude, it is no way. You definitely feel a little bit more on this side, but it's crazy that it is actually dual. And while I still have the car up in the air, I want to wire in the speed sensor. The harness for it was previously cut. So I'm going to have to somehow connect these wires to this point right around here. Although there are some connectors here, so I'm going to have to match up some of the colors. I've determined what wires I need to connect. I'm going to solder them together and then heat shrink them. There must have been a lug nut thief or something because for some reason there's only two lug nuts on each wheel. So if you haven't noticed by now, this is kind of like a budget build Z project. So let's put some budget lug nuts on it. Whew. 
Damn, that's cool. The key actually says Nismo on it. We're installing the bash bar with the fog lights so we get the full effect this time. And we might as well put on turn signals too, right? I mean, this is a full car now. Full front end. First official test drive to get gas. So I didn't check if the fog lights work. I think you have to have the headlights on for those to work though. Green? Why is this green? Seventeen gallons? What? Dude, the, the biggest tank I have is the Integra. It's like 13. Yeah, Google it. Let's see. 18.7. Yeah. And we got 17. Yes, I did ball out and get a Nismo cap on my budget build 300ZX. Next thing I want to do is check the manual trans fluid. Not only check it, but I might as well put in new trans fluid at this time. If you can't get the fill plug off and you already drained the fluid, then what? You're just going to run no fluid? <laughs> so let's see if this actually comes off. We got it. That's a great start. Oh, it's so dark. But usually these plugs are magnets. So you can actually see there's some goodies on there. Reinstall the drain plug. To fill the fluid on the plug that's all the way up there, there's no way we're gonna fit this bottle up there in that tiny space. So we have this fluid pump. It's one direction. Take one end in the bottle, squeeze this, whoop, and the fluid goes into the transmission. Whoop. Well, it ended up taking all three bottles. See the fluid level? Oh yeah, we got fluid. You can put the fill plug back on it. Next, let's diagnose the brake light switch. I'm plugging the fuse back in. Brake lights are on. Now I'm gonna hit the switch. So there were actually two buttons I had to press to check if it changed the light switch or not. The one towards the left was the brake light switch. The one towards the right was not. I'm assuming that was for the cruise control turn off safety or whatever. This is my 10 cent fix. A dime and some RTV. Should do the trick, right? The brake light switch is officially fixed. No brake lights on. Oh, the horn works. Next thing I want to do is take out all of this from the back and clean up all the interior. Nate gave me his very first shifter that came with his Skyline. So this should be the same thread, right? No reverse. This car is finally legit now. We're putting on our plates. <laughs> Thanks, Illinois. This will officially be my longest test drive in the car. That was fun. I got a lot of dust in my eyes though. Yeah? Yeah, because I mean, it's been sitting for so long, it's just been piling up. Yeah, you need a new bumper. Dude, did you see? Look at this. I got you. I'm surprised it didn't break off. How long do you think it'll take you to take every single piece of tan out of this car? 45 minutes. 45 minutes? What time is it? <laughs> I'm timing your ass. It's 9 -0 -0. Hey, she'll be good. She'll be good. We're not doing no work truck. This ain't no work truck, man. This thing is going to be a show yeah? truck. Our tan delete is going by very smoothly. We have how much left? Uh, the dash, really. Right? The dash? Really? Oh, and the carpet. There we go. Makes me so happy to see less tan. <laughs> Sick. We're about to go shopping to see if he has a MAF intake adapter and some stock turn signals. Cause I would prefer the stocks over the all clears, honestly. That was fast. That's that. This is a big filter. I don't even think this is gonna fit in there, dude. It <laughs> stashed away. Yeah, I like those. Stocks or black? That's massive. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the bolt pattern is different on this intake adapter and the KA one is much smaller, so. Round two for that one. Dang. Full service here. This thing sounds good running, doesn't it? Fucking hey, she sounds good. This is KA that could. Oh, just kidding. It's actually his car running. <laughs> <laughs> so the doors seem to auto lock, and I only have one key. Peyton just climbed through this window. <laughs> <You must stop. laughs> 
Hey, get out of my car! Get out of my car! Honestly, thank God that window is not on yet. And thank God you can fit through that window. No door panels. Now, we need to work on cleaning all of this black interior. Well, actually, some of it's blue. I'd rather have it mismatched than be tan. Also, I need to focus on vacuuming out and scrubbing the inside of this car because it's pretty crusty. We've got the interior out here drying on the Fiero. Do you remember a couple episodes ago when I was trying to look for my pinout sheet? The one I spent hours making? Well, here it is. Now that the trunk interior is off, I noticed this metal plate and I'm like, wait, what is this actually doing? And it looks like it's a piece of metal attached to rubber. Easy weight reduction. So Holly, my brother's wife, had this cleaner under the sink, citrus basil. And let me tell you, this smells so refreshing. Every time I get in this car, I'm gonna wanna go get a salad or something now. Oh yeah, look at all that nasty mold. Well, the inside of this car feels way more fresh. So I think it's time that we start throwing in some black interior. Well, this carpet is in a little worse shape than I remember. Yeah, there we go. Next, let's start working on getting these rear bucket things in there. It basically fills all of the trim in the trunk area. Wait, where'd it go? Man, that looks way better. It's definitely not perfect, but this is a great start. Now I still have quite a bit more pieces to install in the car and I think what I'm going to do first is go to Peyton's because I'm going to need to put the dash on. I don't have a dash here. Peyton and I are making some pretty good progress putting the interior back together but since my speedometer doesn't work on the cluster we're going to swap in one of his uh, parts clusters and see if the speedometer works on that one. We decided to check the pins and realized that the cluster that is out of my car is different from this one. That's a shame. Right? That's a shame. No cap. Now it's capping. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's wild too that this dash is technically blue and this is a black center console and you really can't tell the difference. You definitely can. You really can. We may not have 100% black interior, but it's not even 100% not tan, but it's probably 98% tan oh, delete. Yeah. 98, 99% <laughs> not tan. The only thing tan is the, the, the handles, literally. Yeah. One handle, handle, one handle, T-top And handle. the T-top handles. That's literally it. Every year before 95, 96, everything is plug and play. It don't matter if it's manual windows, power windows. Yes, hey, time check this. Don't think we're out here <laughs> at 8 o'clock. No, man. 2.20 this p.m. 2.20 p.m. <laughs> p.m. <laughs> yeah, it's been a late night, but we definitely got a lot done today. Thank you, boys, for all the help. I would not have made it this far without you guys. Hey, you'll be back. Yeah, we'll be back in no time. She's looking mint. She's definitely looking mint. Yeah, she's not too bad. Not too bad. It's got potential. The drive home last night was successful, and that was also the farthest I've ever driven this car. Each time I drive it, I gain a little bit more confidence in the build. And this is also the very first time my 300 gets to meet my 240. The first thing I want to do is diagnose why the speed sensor is not working in my 300ZX. Thank God Nissan put the notch in this trans tunnel for clearance to remove this. Or I guess it's not out yet. Let's not jinx it. <laughs> Come on, you're so close. Quick comparison. Yeah, I mean, they're the same thing. New sensor going in. All right, I said I would test the old sensor, so let's do that really quick. We're gonna start with testing it for ohms or resistance. Nothing. Oh, another thing I'm realizing is some of the teeth are chipped off. That is crazy. In all my years, I've never seen teeth come off of the speed sensor. Oh, is it working? It's working. And the trip is working. Yes. Now this is an uncut harness. Now this is a cut harness, and luckily I have all these spare connectors from all the junkyard cars. Unfortunately I didn't get that connector from the junkyard, so now I have this one. So basically what I need to do now is connect this KA engine harness to this VG30 body harness connector. Now yes, I am soldering this together. I know a lot of people don't like solder, but 
to each their own. Since both of these harnesses are gonna be live, I'm gonna heat shrink the ends of all of them. Here we go, here's our little jumper harness. 300ZX to KA24DE. Let's plug it into the car and see if it works. This is another reason why I left all of these harnesses and wires and ECUs exposed down here because I know I'm not done. So here's the KA harness. This is from the engine bay, ECU, and then the interface harness. So we plug in our brown plugs and then we have the white plug now. This is the 300ZX body harness. So these are the two plugs that connect to the VG engine harness. So the brown plug we are not using. Pretty satisfying. I think it's really awesome that there are no wires cut. A completely uncut, unconverted KA harness and a completely uncut 300ZX body harness. All you need is a little jumper harness in between. Yo, no way. The tachometer works. It honestly looks like the temperature gauge works as well. It doesn't look too accurate. It's reading about 1500 right now. That was probably around two grand on the KA. definitely reads less than it should. But the temperature gauge is working, so that's really cool. We need to drive over to Omar's because I need a KA math adapter. I'll pop the hood and show you. Because right now I'm using a microfiber as an air filter. That's not very ideal. So Franzi is gonna help vacuum the seats and the rest of the interior so we can get this in the car and ready to go. We do still have a bunch of interior we need to install in the car. For now, this is a very good start. I also picked up the missing exhaust tip. I didn't know that these things come off. The stock exhaust that I have for this car only has three of the tips. And it just slides on there. Like that. You're supposed to bolt it on, but it looks like we're missing a stud. Now Peyton also gave me this plate in the trunk here. So everything sits nice and flat. Makes the carpet look really nice in the back. This looks way better. You ready? Let's go. All righty. <laughs> Whoever it's... set this up had horrible posture. Well, you're the first one to sit in it, so. Paige. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's try this one first. All four line up. I am thinking ahead here, and if I put a filter on in this location, it's definitely gonna hit this hood prop. So we're gonna need to find a coupler that we can use to turn down the math. All right, hopefully this is the right size. Oh yeah, it is. All right, let's get a clamp on there. So we're gonna angle this down a little bit. Now all I need is an intake filter at this point. I guess we'll have to stop at the parts store on the way home to put a filter on here. So shout out to Omar for hooking it up with parts once again. Let's go make a stop at the parts store and see what we can find i found one of these cheapo filters i guess they're not really cheap anymore this will get the job done for now and hopefully this fits i didn't test fit this yet well that's just gonna have to do for now at least we're not driving home on a microfiber probably should check the oil i haven't i don't think i checked it yet since running it it's looking good i'm really curious to see how this is going to drive now with a proper intake just from backing out of the parking spot i can already tell a significant difference in throttle response much better oh my god what we have planned is a new windshield to get put in and the quarter glass finally so we have this one here and i'll let him decide which window is better to use on the z before he gets here we're going to see how much interior we can install really want to put these on and in order to do that we got to put on these footwell no no it looks like this square kind of lines up with this tab oh. oh i think it's this side i think it anchors up here see if this fits oh. looks like with this trim we need to put this seal on first i'm pretty sure i have that i grabbed all the seals out of that junkyard car That looks much better. Next, I want to mount that A-pillar trim. This looks way better instead of having a sunroof drain just chilling. Looks like our glass guy is here, so let's do that first. This man works quick. Pretty cool you can still move the glass if you need yeah, to. Yeah, 
Wish my fitment was a little better. I'll put some time into that soon. Yeah, that's a pretty cool spot. After an entire successful day in Chicago, I think it is finally time that we fix this front end fitment. Wow, that's so satisfying. That's <laughs> awesome, actually, wow. That is so awesome. <laughs> Instant fitment correction. I don't need to take anything off. <laughs> Dude, that looks so good. It really does. What'd you think? Nice. All right. It's smooth actually. It's dude, it's so smooth. Ultimate grandpa car. Once you, you get used to that clutch, dude, it's like nothing. Yeah, turn right? The yeah, turn the headlights on. How off. do you do that? Oh. Yeah, there you go. I think it's time that we give the Z its very first wash. Definitely satisfying giving a car the first wash. But this one black wheel is such an eyesore. And I'm pretty sure this is Plasti Dip. There's like remnants of Plasti Dip on all the wheels. And since I'm tired of looking at this third brake light, this is probably the biggest eyesore on this entire car. It came broken, brand new in the box. So that's kind of unfortunate. I might still throw it on though, because it'll look better than this at least. No wonder why these brake. This design is so poor. Oh. Okay, so it slides in. That means this should slide out this way, yep. Yeah. It looks like the previous owner tried to glue the adhesive or the trim onto the actual trunk of the car. So I'm trying to find a non-abrasive way to remove it. Mint paint. Before I put these clips in, we're going to have Fran hit the brakes to see if the one third brake light actually turns on. And it does not. Wait, do it again. Let go. Yeah, it doesn't work. Okay, definitely looks better. I guess I can finally throw in these floor mats. So this is the passenger mat. Definitely needs a vacuum. Date night test. When I was swapping the ECU on this car, I noticed all the computers down by the footwell, and there's one that said keyless entry, and that caught my attention. So I did some research, and apparently some of these 300ZXs came with keyless entry. I don't know if it was factory or an option, but mine had the box. So I ordered a key fob. This isn't the original, this isn't Nissan, but it's the same generation chip on the inside. And I was looking up the directions on how to link it, and honestly, it kind of looks like a joke. I was like, no way, but... We're gonna try it out and I'll walk you through it. Let's see if it actually works. Step one, open the trunk. <laughs> That's kind of weird. All right, trunk is open. Step two, close and lock all doors. Close and lock. That one does power lock, surprisingly. Three, insert and remove the key from the ignition six times within 10 seconds. Huh. One, two, three, Four, five, six. Manually unlock and lock the driver's door once to enable. Manually lock, unlock and lock. Okay. Belting mode. Five, push lock button on new remote once. No. Oh, no way. I heard it lock with the button. Unlock trying to unlock it from outside the car and it's doing nothing and i just remembered that when i put the new carpet in there was this random gray wire that i left out i think that plugged into one of those computer boxes so let's see if that was to the keyless entry box because maybe this wire acts as a signal amplifier i don't know we'll see keyless entry see look at that open port let's uh plug this in here interesting connector interesting plug Never seen anything ever like this one. All right, let's try now. Oh, it worked now. I heard it. Dude, no way. Let's see if the trunk works then. Oh. <laughs> what? So this does have a motor in it. I don't even know where it's at. Dude, that is so cool. I'm, s I'm sorry for being overly hyped about this, but... I've never had a key fob in my entire life. All of my cars are from the 90s. Now the horn stopped working recently, so I wonder if 
you know, you double click the lock if it beeps. I'll have to figure out what's going on with the horn. It did work at one point, but not anymore. Oh, yep, locked. Ah. Oh my gosh, this thing is luxury. I almost forgot about this tail light. Let's replace that really quick. Can't believe there's only supposed to be four nuts that hold on these tail lights. Usually these tail lights are very difficult to remove from the car because of the adhesive. This actually still has it. It's super sticky. This one looks dried out, so I'm sure that was just leaking water straight into my trunk. This is another one of those areas we're not going to be seeing for a while. And this was really gunked up. It actually looks like there's a dead spider in there. We waited for it and it finally came. This is an alternate tachometer adapter. And this product also states that it can convert speed sensor, the gas signal, diesel tech. So I'm pretty excited to try this one out. Guess we gotta tear this car back apart. All cleaned up. I also tried to color coordinate them. So this is the box that we're gonna be using. And it looks like we're gonna have to stick the wires within the side of it, tighten it down. And there's a whole bunch of options that we can put it in. Now, after reading the directions, it's very simple. Red is gonna go to ignition plus. Yellow is gonna be our wire to the tack body harness. Purple is going to be our signal from the engine and black is going to be ground. So we have power, ground, tack input down here and tack output down here. Press and hold the set switch while turning the ignition on. Release the set switch. The display will show speed. Okay, speed. Tap increase until it shows tack. Increase, tack. Tap the set switch and then tap increase until 9AS is shown. Okay, set. 9AS, all right. Now that it says 9AS, we need to hit set. Okay, now it says in. So in means what you're putting into the car. So we have a four cylinder, so we need to go increase until it says four. 15, 15, 16, one. You can put a one cylinder, wow. Four cylinder, okay, we're gonna hit set. Out, now out is what it's going into. So this is a six cylinder car. Four, five, six, set. Yo, it looks like it reads correctly. What? All right, test drive. So this is how I try and prepare the wires that are about to be wrapped. I'll put a piece of tape where I want the length to be for the shielding. And I'll also tape the base as well. And fish this through the whole thing. And when you're all finished up, it could look something like this. I ended up tucking that box away right up here. The wiring harness goes through the back. Can't even see it. I put a small zip tie just to hold it in place. Glove box will be on it and you won't even know it's there. How to take off a steering wheel on a 300ZX. You just give it a nice tug. Now you have to take off the airbag first, but you wanna make sure that you disconnect your battery because there is a chance that there's enough power that when you disconnect it, it could explode. Pro tip, put the nut back on, a couple threads, so that when you're pulling the steering wheel loose, it doesn't smack you in the face. Sometimes these are really hard to get off. There we go. Now, before I commit to putting the quick release on, I want to make sure that this has good distance without it, because I don't think this is a short hub. I started one screw. You know what? I think I like it like this. Let's see how spaced out it would be with the quick release. Oh my gosh. Look at how far away it is from the turn signal. What do you guys think? Wood wheel or stock wheel? Today, we are gonna be making a jig to convert the 300ZX to use S13 front suspension. This is the S14 that we are going to be using. It is actually the front half of an S14. We'll start attaching the stock pieces to this car. Well, do I call it a car? We'll call it a half cut. And then we'll try and weld it all in place so that nothing is able to move. This is about to be the strangest way I've ever put on a subframe. I've prepped the control line, the upper top head, and some metal. So I plan to use one straight beam to go in place of the shock, and then two little beams to basically reinforce the whole structure to make sure it's not wobbly. I want it to be as accurate as possible. Now let's just hope that we can actually get it off the car. 
got the jig off and we went ahead and made the other side as well. Thank you, Devin, for helping me out and letting me use your stuff. You're welcome, bro. There's so much more room. For real. Now, I also had to pick up some stock front knuckles and then Omar let me borrow some stock front shocks. The lower control arm bolt is on the left. Just good to take note of your hardware and what you're working with in case you get it mixed up. It did not fall down like I thought it would. I guess it's still hanging on by these studs. So now I'm running into some issues. I'm not able to seat this lower control arm bolt all the way, and that is because the shock tower won't slide forward enough to allow it. It keeps hitting this ridge here, which on the top it looks like this, a little indent. So I may just cut a sliver in it. That way I can hammer it up enough to allow it to slide forward. I will eventually have to cut out this entire piece here and weld a flat plate. That way the coilover can bolt to it securely. snail <laughs> we fully welded in this shock tower we also welded the bottom of it as well perfect we'll just tack it in on the corner and then hammer it down to fit the rest first thing I'm gonna do is mount the coil next let's slide on the lower control arm all right let's bolt on a tension arm no way, it's already lining up perfectly. I don't know if this taper is the same for this knuckle. Looks like the taper is different. Picked up some S14 outer tie rods. Now we're gonna put the new inner tie rod on. We'll have to align it when we have the other side mounted as well, because I don't know how far this needs to go. Next we'll put on the Z brake rotor. And then we'll slide on the caliper. Now, since we're putting this Z caliper on an S chassis knuckle, you do either have to run shorter bolts or add a washer to the bolt. If you don't do that, when you stick the bolt through the knuckle, it'll hit the rotor. We can now verify that the rotor spins freely, which it does. Turn the knuckle around and make sure that our brake line is not twisted. Now we are ready to start doing the alignment. We'll put the wheels as straight as we can. I still have to swap out this tie rod end to the S14. And then most importantly, we need to center the steering wheel all the way to the right. So it's upside down. One, two, three. We need to turn it 1.5 to be centered. 1.5. Now let's check our tie rod ends and see where they line up. Oh man, if that's centered, that's definitely not gonna be enough threads. Even if I spin this out. <laughs> well, technically it's supposed to go on the bottom. But... This is the Z32 inner tie rod. This is the Q45 tie rod, the one I thought was gonna work. And this is the one I just picked up. This is from an S14. Notice how it is just slightly shorter than the Q45 and a significant amount longer than the Z32. Let's slap on these S14 inner tie rods. Oh man, it's not even seating all the way on top. Yep. Yeah, it's definitely hitting. I guess I should try and put on some other wheels, huh? That's even more exciting than putting stocks back on. Now these stocks are 16 by seven and a half plus 45. These G33s are 17 by nine plus 15. 15 is favorable in the front for S chassis. We'll see how it fits on the Z. I feel like I'm gonna have some poke, honestly. So these coilovers did not have top hat adjustments for camber, but the stock OEM adjustment is actually through the knuckle bolt holes. So if you loosen these up, you can actually get some play here. So we're gonna have to do that first. Now that it's loose, this is how you can adjust camber. Pushing it in is more negative, pulling it out, more positive. So we're gonna push it in all the way and then tighten it like that. 
All right, I guess that's a little better. The toe is definitely off. That's all right, that's manageable for now. Does not hit the coilover. We're probably gonna have to max negative the other side as well. I don't know if I can close the hood. I think these studs are gonna actually hit. Oh yeah, it's hitting. I hammered out the studs in the top hat and replaced them with nuts and bolts. The other side I didn't, just out of curiosity, and it's definitely hitting. You can see the studs sticking up a significant amount. Yeah, that's gonna poke for sure. We're still test driving this thing, I don't care. I'm just going around the block at least with the hood popped. Well, it definitely looks lower already. Still super positive. I'm definitely gonna need to put an upper camber plate adjustment. All right, well, no clunks so far. That's a good sign. First test, speed bump. I don't know about you guys, but I am so ready for this 300ZX to be sitting right. I have been eagerly awaiting this box to show up. Well, actually I picked it up. Z32 rears and S13 fronts. There's a few other things I need to do while I'm under the car. We have new rack bushings. These are poly and they're red, so you know it's gonna be fast. GK Tech tension arms. Now there's an upgrade I'm gonna do to increase the longevity of these. I'll show you that part when we get there. And also an oil change. Can you believe we've driven over 3000 miles in one month on this car? Mentioned in the last video, I wanted to extend a pair of control arms to correct that positive camber. But before I do that, I'm going to slam the car to the fitment I like because I think that the fact that it's raised so high has to do with why it's positive. Because when you lower a car, it will naturally have negative camber. This will probably be my last time jacking the car up directly from the subframe without using any wooden blocks to drive on. Now for the upgrades on the tension arms. So first thing I like to do with these arms is spin out the outer fitting. Spin off the locking washer and lock nut, and then spin them onto this Aurora bearing. These are military grade spherical bearings, and they're also reverse thread. The part number is VCAB-12. Thread it back into the arm. Now what I do is match the length from the old tension arm to the new one. So it looks like we're gonna have to extend it. See how it's lengthening both sides equally. And then we'll snug up the jam nut and then spin the secondary jam nut. And it looks like there's an Allen key adjustment in the back. That's new, that wasn't on the old version of these arms. And to save time, I evened out both of the tension arms to about the same distance. The point of the angled tension arm is to get more angle or more turning radius. It's notched out because that's where the tire is now gonna sit. And as for the bushings, you put the bigger spacer on the left side because that is ultimately gonna push the arm farther in, even farther in. If you have it shorter, then obviously it'll be farther towards the wheel. We want to push it away from the wheel. Start by spinning up the locking collar, then we'll spin down the mount all the way to the base. We are ready to test fit a wheel. I'm really hoping it'll fit in the wheel well. It's pretty low already. Hmm, do I make the coilover lower or do I wait for the suspension to settle a bit? Fun fact, the stock 300ZX brake lines line up perfectly to fit into the brake line mount on the coilover with the clip installed too. No binding, nothing. So let's throw on the rack bushings before we drain the oil so we don't get oil everywhere. In order to take off the rack, we have to take off the bolts in between here and here. Oh, that's gonna be hard to get on. That was pretty easy. Let's start draining the oil and taking off the oil filter. Ooh, it's dark. Nothing shiny, really. These just make such a mess. Technically doing the rear coils should be a lot easier because it's only three bolts. Let's find where those top two bolts are. Hmm. My guess is right here. Oh my gosh, you have to take off the rear panels too because this panel is underneath it. There we go. All of that work just to get here. There we go. Now the question is, how low do we go? We'll go a significant amount. I'm not sure I want to slam this all the way up. Carefully slide this through. I'm going to install it on the top first. 
Something I just remembered is how crusty these rear sway bar link bushings are. So I have some new energy ones I want to throw on. There we go. Got the old crusty ones out of there. Now let's decide what wheels we want to throw on the rear. Just out of curiosity, I really want to see how these RG2s look. These tires are shot, so I will not be able to run these. Whew. Now that's hot. Next, let's try the Urus. Maybe that'll fit. <laughs> that fits like the same. This one just needs a smaller tire, I think. Same issue. Definitely gonna rub. Unless I raise it a little bit. Do I want to do that though? Man, that looks so good. Now, I will admit, I've never done the hammer method before for rolling quarters, but it didn't turn out bad. There's no waves, no dents. Now for the moment we've all been waiting for, putting the car on the ground. Also, I'm gonna leave the rear suspension all gutted for now because the dampening is on top for the rears. The front dampening adjustment is on the bottom. Dude, the chrome on the teal blue green, man. I need to get the front adjusted. Honestly, the tire is too big to run in the front. I might just put those valve sides on and just keep filling them up. It's kind of annoying in order to drive it this low. You got too much meat. This is how it's gonna sit. I definitely am gonna extend my lower control arms. I've already drawn a line for smokes to cut. He has a bandsaw at his house, which I would much rather use instead of using an angle grinder. I could definitely use an angle grinder and get it pretty straight, but if there's a bandsaw available, we're gonna use that. Got our lower control arms back from smokes, and instead of two pieces, they're now in four pieces. And thankfully he labeled them left versus right, otherwise they're pretty easily confusable, so. Thanks for the labeling, dude. So I'm gonna measure out some metal. I think I'm gonna space them out about 25 millimeters. Well, these came out absolutely beautiful. I am ecstatic with the outcome here. This is about how much of an extension we have. Since we've extended our lower control arms, we now need to lengthen our inner tie rod. I personally don't think there's going to be enough threads in this S14 inner tie rod. Let's spin it out to straight and see how it looks. Dude, that was not enough. <laughs> okay, so that's why I kept those Q45 inner tie rods. Q45 versus S14. Q45 is just slightly longer, which is perfect. That's exactly what we need. Inner tie rod's nice and tight. Let's thread on our S14 outer. So we need to spin this in. A little bit more. We're all snugged up. Let's do a quick thread check on our tie rod end. I still have the micrometer set. We have plenty of threads. Basically what this is measuring is how many threads are inside the outer tie rod. Because you really don't want those to be hanging on by like two or three threads. All it takes is one hard bump or one hard steer for your inner tie rods to strip out. Camber is officially corrected. That's about exactly where I'd want it. It's probably minus three degrees is my guess. It's pretty close to what I have on the 240. I think the 240 has a bit more. The fitment is so perfect now. Oh, dude, that's so close. Oh, right here. Should I just try taking this off and see if it's good? Man, it's so cool to see them next to each other. Slammed. It's funny because the Z is now lower than the 240. <laughs> I didn't think that was going to happen that way, honestly. The 240 doesn't scrape nearly as much as the Z does. say the suspension self-steering was a great improvement. Before when I had the stock 300ZX suspension, when you would go full lock, it would stay full lock. But here it was able to self-correct, auto-correct. So that was a really nice perk of having the McPherson conversion. Welcome to the Midwest.
As you guys have just seen, I ran into many roadblocks while building this car. So the next time you come across a problem, just know it can be overcome and it may be a good learning experience for you. Damn, that sunset though. Thank you guys so much for sticking around for this extra long video. I hope you guys enjoyed the one year progression. I'm very happy with how far it's come. It's definitely nowhere near complete. I have some big things planned, big things coming up. I can't wait to share it with you guys. It'll be out soon. Never stop progressing, right? Keep at it. Don't forget to drop a like if you haven't already. Subscribe to see more and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.